Yep. Here we go. <laughs> That's where we're at, folks. Uh, technical difficulties. It's whatever life throws at you. That's the lesson we're going to learn here today. Uh, but today I'm really excited. I, as I said, guys, my name is Jordan Peterson. I'm the director of business development and marketing over here as, at our hospital. Um, I myself do come from a little bit of a clinical background as well, previously having worked with youth and their and families in their homes doing crisis stabilization. Um, and with us today, we have our director of outpatient services for our Glendale Hospital, uh, Ms. Jacqueline Ojala. She has done some fantastic presentations here for us, and I'm really excited for what she's going to be sharing with you all today. Um, but just to get us started, I'm going to kick things off here. And as I mentioned earlier before, it is Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. And so as a hospital, this is something that is very vital and very important to us. Um, it is one of the number one things that we do as a hospital um, is really for treating different things in regards to mental health and substance use disorders. And so really, I encourage all of you, if you haven't done anything yet to really help spread awareness for suicide prevention, there's a lot of ways that you can take part. Sometimes it's as simple as sharing something on social media. Um, we have some content and things like that on our different social media pages as well. So you can go on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, there's blog posts you can share, um, but really the easiest way is just having an open conversation with those in your life, helping spread awareness that way that um, it is okay to not be okay. And there's a lot of resources out there. And sometimes it's as simple as just putting a resource in your cell phone. So we're going to have a lot of resources for you guys here today. And I, I can't wait to get to those. So let's talk about suicide prevention awareness. Many of you might have heard that this is a silent epidemic and it's incredibly true. So globally, uh, we actually lose a person to suicide every 40 seconds. That is over 2,000 people a day on average that we lose to suicide just on a daily basis. So that's that number is pretty staggering in its own. It, it carries a lot of weight when you really think about that, because if you just think about the fact that this could be a two-hour presentation, you know how many people have been affected. You know how many family members have been impacted by that as well. So let's talk a little bit, though, about our own backyard, Arizona. So in Arizona, every 2.17 days, on an average, a young person ages 10 to 24 is lost to the silent epidemic of youth suicide. Incredibly tragic. And Arizona has really seen different fluctuations of this. For those that are unaware, um, even Queen Creek, which isn't that far away from our, you know, Tempe location we have, um, they actually were one of the number one spots in the world for youth suicide just a few years here back. Um, as a suicide prevention trainer myself, there are not certain demographics that contribute to that. Um, really depression, mental health challenges, and suicide itself can impact people regardless of things like age, gender, occupation, socioeconomic status. Um, there's certainly risk factors that help kind of with mental health challenges, but we've seen, we've seen this in all kinds of different ways. Um, whenever I have this presentation and there's a little bit more of a Q&A going, right, there's celebrities that we lose to, to suicide. Um, Kate Spade's one that comes to mind that I think shocked the world. And it really is something that we need to have a more open and honest conversation about because unfortunately, that's kind of the issue is that there's so much stigma surrounding these things. Now, I want to share a bit of hope with you all before we get a little bit more into this. And that's that each year we're very fortunate in that we get invited to take part in, a, in an event here called Teen Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. It's called T-SPA. That's what we call it for short because we got to be, you know, hip with the kids. Um, and really with that, we go out to a lot of different local high schools here. And usually during a lunch hour, we're there with a few other organizations. And, you know, we talk to students and, you know, I've taken part in this event for a couple of years. And, you know, two years ago, prior to COVID, when we were talking to youth at various tables and things like that, and they'd come up, a lot of the times kids come up, right? And they go, Ooh, what's the free stuff you guys have? You have a stress ball, do you have candy, you know, stuff like that. Um, and can't blame them. I mean, that's the fun stuff. But in reality, you know, a good turnout for an event or good engagement with youth at, a, at an event like that would maybe be 50 to 60, you know, teenagers come up and just have a conversation about mental health. Maybe they do some mental health trivia this year. Uh, you know, we, we or better yet, two years ago, a big event, a really high engagement might be 100 kids. This year, we're seeing an average of over 200 kids engaging with all of the vendors. So it really just shows how much we're seeing things just change over time and how much COVID has kind of opened the door to that conversation a little bit about mental health. Uh, before we jump in here a little bit more, though, let's talk about how things get to that point, right? So we're, we're a behavioral health hospital. 
Um, sorry, first and foremost, I see we do have some hands raised. Um, I really encourage you guys if we can, because with the Zoom webinar format, we don't really have the ability to have the unmuting and things like that. Things can get a little, uh, little hairy with that. So one thing I will ask is if you have questions, we absolutely encourage it. Questions, comments. Um, Kevin is and Kevin and myself here are actually going to monitor the chat and the Q and A and just make sure that we can help answer those things as we need to here. Um, so please direct your questions, comments right into those sections. We'll be happy to go through those. We really appreciate everyone's cooperation with that. Um, so moving here into our next slide a little bit though, we really want to talk about how things get from I'm feeling not quite myself to I'm in crisis and I'm in need of hospitalization. And the truth is it sometimes seems like that happens overnight. And don't get me wrong, there's certain instances where that can happen. But truthfully, and if we even look at suicide statistics, um, someone who's died by suicide, uh, there's kind of this idea, and we get it sometimes from movies, we get it from different things, um, from media that maybe like a big drastic event happened, and then that person, you know, just did not see another option in that instance, and they chose to take their life, right? So lost your job, can't support your family, um, loss of a loved one, things like that. These are all things that can be contributing factors to when we look at suicide statistics. However, it's a very small percentage of the time when that's the case. Um, if someone has had either a suicide attempt or they've been thinking about suicide and they've even voiced it to somebody, there's a good chance they've been having some of those thoughts, even in a fleeting capacity or in a smaller way um, for quite some time. It's not something that usually is just, I had this thought and it's there. And it's because unfortunately we don't like to talk about things like that as much, right? Just like, um, just to relate to it, if anyone here, if you have any health conditions, sometimes we don't like to share those things. It's very personal, it's very intimate and it's very scary. And there's a lot of stigma around it because whether it's the athlete who is always good at everything and always ranks number one, now I'm suddenly having these thoughts, you know, that might be seen as a, a sign of weakness. People might look at me differently than they ever have before. Um, there's so many different reasons why folks, you know, we don't like to talk about this and it's because it's, it, it can be really scary, but the number one way we combat it is to talk more openly about it, talk about how we're doing. And so I'm not trying to jump ahead too much. Jacqueline's going to kind of get into a little bit more of that, of how we can start those conversations with youth today. Um, but realistically, I've used a lot of different metaphors for how these things really happen over time. Um, most of the time, and this even goes with substance use, substance use and alcohol and things like that, it can come back to mental health quite a bit. Um, a lot of times those are things that are being utilized in coping uh, strategies and things like that. And then those things start to snowball as well. So as we can see here on the screen, we have the snowball effect. I'm sure a lot of people here are familiar with the snowball effect. Um, but an idea that we talk about is just that in reality, we have different stressors. We have different things that happen throughout our day. We have um, whatever life kind of throws at you. At the start of this presentation, I couldn't get Zoom to work. I had to leave Zoom. That was a stressor. Now, I also had almost 100 people <laughs> waiting on me to get this working right. There's a stress in that, right? But I'm going to try and manage through that moment and get through it. Um, but at the same time, it, it threw my day off a little bit, sure. And I want to just be conscious of that. However, we're going to encounter different things that hit us in different ways. I didn't have a meltdown. I'm not, I didn't quit and leave and go and I, you know, turn in my two weeks at Aurora, right? Um, I know that, you know what, ultimately, things are going to be okay in this situation. If something more drastic happened, sure, I might treat, you know, that might affect me a little bit more. I might freak out a little bit. Um, and so the thing is, we're, especially youth, they're growing up. Kids, adolescents, teenagers, they're trying to learn how to become adults constantly. And they really want to become adults. But sometimes that comes with learning how to deal with really difficult emotions and really stressful situations. And so a lot of the times these stresses build over time. And so it might be slight anxiety, it might be stress, it might be kind of the starter of depression. Um, within that, if we, we try and manage these things and kind of, you know, uh, put a lid on it over here, put this one over here, uh oh, this one almost got away, let's try and figure that one out. But the thing is, once you stop being able to catch up with all that, that's when things really start to spiral. And that's when we see the snowball effect really start to happen. We start to see that get bigger and bigger and bigger. And even though we haven't been talking about the things that have been stressing us out and the things that we've been able to kind of manage up until now, it might've been months that we've been just managing these stressful situations. And now we're in a crisis mode. And that's realistically what happens with our hospitals. You know, we do a lot of community pre presentations. We work with a lot of schools. We work with 
everything, churches, uh, faith, you know, faith-based organizations. We work with um, just random companies that want to do wellness things for their employees. And it's one of the number one things that we hear is just, well, you know, you know, you work at a psych hospital and there's some stigma that goes into that is like, oh, well, what, you know, what's your average patient like? And people get really curious about that. And it just goes, well, um, frankly, our, our average patient is any single person that's sitting here on the Zoom here today. And that's the reality of it is that each one of us, we have our own ups and downs. We have our challenges um, at any given point. Any single one of us could be a few moments away from needing to, OK, you know what? I'm not feeling not feeling myself and not feeling OK. I'd like to explore some therapy options. It might be getting an individual therapist. In other ways, it could be that, OK, I am in crisis right now and I don't know how I got here, but I need help. And with that, too. That's why places like what we do exist. And, and I'm happy to share more about our hospital towards the end here. Happy to answer any questions about hospitalization. What does it look like? We'll go over a little bit of that if you'd like. Um, and seriously, any questions that go into that, that's what we're here for to do today. Um, but just to kind of give you a, a little background over just, you know, we, we hear a lot of folks that go, well, I know about individual therapy, right? I've, I've heard of groups. I've heard of AA. I've heard of a lot of different things like that. But I don't really know a whole lot about them. Uh, there's kind of a big road in between needing nothing, needing individual therapy, and needing inpatient hospitalization. And so we actually, we provide most of these levels of care just at our hospital. So again, in our community education, we do like to tell folks that there's a lot of different ways to try and assess and figure out um, where it's for yourself, maybe it's for a loved one, a child, um, what, where's the right place to start? And part of that comes down to what different symptoms somebody might ex be experiencing. But just to give you a quick overview, um, kind of the first level somebody might go into is if they're really starting to look at therapies. Individual therapy is the great place, great, great place to start. And there's a lot of different places that do it. There's community clinics. There's a lot of health practices. Um, but one of the easiest ways that you can find an individual therapist right now is just by going to psychologytoday.com. You can look up things in your area. You can look up by insurance provider. You can look up by specialty. And it'll give you people in your area that are a match for that. Um, and so individual therapy for anyone unfamiliar, because I just I want to keep things general for folks. Uh, you can attend individual therapy up to weekly, uh, maybe every two weeks maybe once a month. It really is based on what an individual need is for you or for whoever that is. Um, however, let's say that you started going to individual therapy and you think to yourself, okay, you know, this is helpful, but I just, I don't know if it's quite enough. Well, there's a step up from that. And we call that intensive out an, an intensive outpatient program. So for us, that's something that we provide. That's the first level of care that we provide as a hospital at our outpatient clinics. Um, and what that looks like is it's a group therapy format setting. And I always like to make the joke with folks uh, when I used to hear things when I didn't study psychology and things like that, I would hear group therapy and I would go, wow, I really hope group therapy is like a discounted thing, because if I have to share the room with everybody else, how does that work, you know, and that was kind of my naive uh, sense of what group therapy actually is. Um, but group therapy is actually a more intensive level of care, and it's a different type of processing. It's, it's a much more intensive therapy, and usually someone will go to an IOP program, that's what we call it for short, for three days a week, three hours at a time, and they'll do that for six to eight weeks. Um, and so that really can be a huge thing that helps prevent hospitalizations. Um, but it's also a really great thing if someone does and they have an inpatient hospitalization, you know, transitioning back home, that can be a scary process, right? There might be triggers there. There might be different stressors and things like that with going back to school, going back to work. Um, that in all reality, if someone steps down, it makes a lot of sense to go into a program like that as well, because you have that therapeutic support. And so as, as you go about your day again, you can actually go back and process that in the group, you know, later that evening or that morning, whatever that looks like. Um, Another option that's out there, and we're, we're seeing kind of more and more of a need for this nowadays, especially, is that there's even still an in-between option between that intensive group therapy and inpatient 24-7 treatment. Uh, and that's called partial hospitalization. Uh, if someone goes to a program like that, and we run that for adults all year long, um, and during the summertime, we actually run it for adolescents as well. We know that summertime's a big time for triggers. But within that, someone will go to treatment for a PHP, partial hospitalization, uh, for five days a week for up to six hours at a time. And they'll do that for usually two weeks, sometimes upwards of three. Um, from there, as a person progresses through a program like that, it's not uncommon that they step right on down into that IOP group, that three days a week level. And so honestly, the longer that somebody can maintain going through these levels, 
um, the better the long-term recovery outcomes for a person can be. Uh, mental health is not the same as physical health, even though there's a lot of parallels. Um, with physical health, depending on what's going on with you, there are medications that can function like a light switch, right? There's, if you have an infection, there's antibiotics, there's things like that that can work a little differently. However, when we look at um, mental health, medication can absolutely be a tool that's very helpful, but there's a lot more to that. And there's a lot of daily upkeep and things that we do to help you know, maintain mental wellness. And it's just such an important thing to do to have that support along the way. But finally, if, if especially someone is having active suicidal thoughts and things like that, um, inpatient treatment is typically the route that someone would go at that point. But again, somebody's in crisis at that moment. And so we need to get that highest level of support for that person. And then eventually they can step their way down into different types of programs. Some folks, they might go down into a PHP program, that partial hospitalization. Others might drop right down into that IOP option, that three days a week. And others, they might have an individual therapist after they come out of an, an inpatient stay. Um, but typically, and just this is to help answer any questions, and I'm jumping on the front end, but an inpatient stay at a hospital, um, like I will speak for us, we're a voluntary hospital, um, 100%. And within that, someone will be here for usually one to two weeks. Um, adolescents can be up to two to three weeks, but usually it's because we're helping connect families with more community providers and things like that. So getting some of those therapy services and that sort of thing going. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a breakdown um, and help just offer some education about different types of therapy that are out there, because I know there's a lot of questions that are there, and sometimes we're a little too nervous to ask about those things. Again, same reason we're too nervous to bring up what we're going through at a certain point in time. But within that, I am going to introduce our other presenter here today, who's going to take it away for a little while, uh, Miss Jacqueline Ojala. Um, so as much as you can, clap your hands at home. I know you're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Can you guys see me and hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, and I'm really excited to be here. I've done a few of these for Jordan. Um, my name is Jacqueline. I am the Director of Outpatient Services at Aurora Behavioral Health at our Glenda location. Um, and I have a real passion for um, helping others with their mental health and particularly for our adolescent patients. Um, they have a very special place in all of our hearts, I think, um, at Aurora. So we'd love to be of service in any way we can. So I'm gonna go ahead and share some information here, um, like Jordan said, and hopefully we can answer some of those questions that maybe aren't um, answered by this presentation. Um, so the first thing that we have here are warning signs. And I think it's really important, like Jordan said, to get better at identifying things that we're struggling with early on, right? So with that snowball effect that he was talking about, um, there really is a huge preventative aspect to mental health. Um, if we can identify our stressors early and seek assistance with those, um, we're more likely to be successful and also to need a lower level of care, right? So hopefully to prevent hospitalization, although it can always be done, just like Jordan said. Um, so uh, Jordan, um, on here, we want to give some warning signs for depression, anxiety, and maybe some um, suicidal ideation in adolescence, correct? Absolutely, yeah. So just okay. warning signs and things like that to look out for. So let me pull up our next slide here. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so like Jordan was saying, what I see with adolescents is that um, they have a lot going on. Um, and as parents, we all know that as our children start to get older, um, we start to lose some control of them, right? They're starting to live their own life outside of our homes. Um, and with that, we don't always know what's going on with them. Um, so it can be hard as a parent to recognize early when our children aren't doing well. Um, but here are some of the things that you can try to look out for. Um, one of those things would be withdrawing and isolating, right? So um, I know for teenagers, this can be somewhat of a normal behavior and they do want to spend some more time alone away from the family. So they might be shut in their rooms quite a bit, maybe playing video games and things like this. But 
Um, the type of withdrawing and isolating we're talking about is in all aspects of life, right? So not just from the family, but maybe they are not reaching out to friends as much as they used to, or um, maybe aren't going out. Maybe they stopped activities that they used to be excited about, right? Um, maybe friends are asking them to go do things and they're not. Um, they can be not answering messages and things like that. Um, so those are some things to be, um, looking out for. It shows that they're disconnecting. Um, that's what that is showing us. Um, I think a lot of these are hard, um, anger and sadness, mood changes are one of those warning signs. Again, adolescents, um, and teenagers struggle to regulate their moods in general, but, um, we're talking about those extremes, right? Where it seems like, it doesn't really fit the situation. Um, you notice that it's outside of the norm for the child. And um, those are some things to look out for. Um, definitely if they start to make comments, right? So um, comments about not wanting to be here anymore, or um, I may as well just go ahead and die, you know, things like that. Um, a lot of times it's offhand comments that they'll start to say, and it's kind of like testing the waters of telling you what's going on. Um, so I think it's really important to pay attention to that. Also, it says on here, to, um, talk of harming others, right? So that can be a sign of anger that's building up in them. Um, this could be maybe they're being bullied at school. Um, maybe they're being... Um, uh, isolated from their friend groups on purpose by their friends. And so that anger can be turned toward certain um, social groups at school and they might start expressing thoughts of wanting to hurt other people. So those are things to pay attention to. Um, feeling hopeless and helpless. I think, I mean, I know we all can identify with that to a certain extent in this current climate. Um, with everything that everyone is going through. And so I think it's really common for adolescents to feel this way right now. Um, however, this is a warning sign, right? So hopelessness is kind of a precursor to suicidal ideation. It can happen at the same time, um, but it's an indication that someone is feeling like they don't have any other way of coping with what's going on with them. And when we feel like that, we tend to start becoming suicidal. So that's why that one's a big warning sign. How to start the conversation, right? I think this is a toughie. Um, so we might be starting to see these warning signs in our children um, and not really know how to have that conversation with them. Um, I know I've had to, I've tried to have these conversations with my child as well, and they tend to become defensive very easily, right? Um, so here are some tips for trying to um, talk to our children with their mindset in mind. Um, so the first one is just to listen. Um, I think oftentimes we want to solve the problem for our children. And so the first thing we do is begin to lecture um, and not just out of love, but children don't tend to respond very well to that. Um, they want to be heard. That's the biggest thing. So we have to show them that we care by being willing to listen to them, even if we don't agree with what they're saying or even understand what they're talking about. Um, and making time to listen. Um, I think with that, we're all very busy. I think as parents, we're struggling to juggle everything in our lives um, and making the time to actually sit down with our children so that they can muster up the courage to talk to us is really on our shoulders, right? It's our job to make sure that we're making that time for them. Um, empathizing. Um, I do this through validation, right? So just saying things like, wow, I can really see that you're struggling lately. You know, um, it makes sense that you would feel the way you do. 
right? Things like that. Just trying to um, put yourself in their shoes, even if it's hard to understand. Um, just letting them know that I'm trying to understand, right? Instead of criticizing or saying that doesn't make sense, right? Or I don't see why you're struggling with this so much. Um, don't wait until crisis. Um, so yeah, it, you know, again, addressing these things early, right? So if your kid's struggling with regulating their emotions um, and things like that, we want to make sure that we get them help early, that we're having these conversations early and not waiting until they're exploding, right? Um, this is my favorite tactic, which is um, choosing an appropriate setting. So I know I've made the mistake sometimes of, you know, they're watching their favorite program and I try to have this conversation with them about, um, you know, their mental health or um, the mood that they're in or their behavior and it doesn't work. Um, so I find that making sure that you're in an environment where they don't have any other distractions, um, using the body is really helpful with children. Um, they don't like to make eye contact. They don't like to, you know, necessarily sit and face to face and have those conversations, taking a walk, um, making sure that like, even like playing basketball, if you have a basketball hoop, but just letting kids be active while they talk tends to help them open up, um, and doing something physical, even like, um, giving them kinetic sand to play with, like at the table while you're talking to them. So just trying to be mindful of the setting and the environment um, and the factors that are going on when you're trying to have that conversation. Coping strategies, our favorite, right? We need so many of these. Um, so for me, I feel like, because we talked about the fact that kids don't like to be lectured to, right? They don't like to be told um, how they should do things and the best way to do things. They don't necessarily always think that we know what we're talking about, right? <laughs> Even if we do. So um, the best way we can help our kids with coping strategies is to model that behavior. Um, they may act like they don't care about what we say or do um, and that they're too cool for us, but they really do pay attention. Um, so if you want your child to talk about how they're feeling, we have to talk about how we're feeling. Uh, and I think this comes as a shock to most parents when I have this conversation with them, because I think we've been taught, or at least I have been taught, I felt like by society that my job as a mother was to be strong and to always put a good face to my kids, right? But that's actually not helpful to them. It doesn't teach them about the common feelings and stressors that we go through in our everyday life and how to cope with those things. If they're not watching it happen, they're not going to learn just by us talking to them about it. So our job is to identify how we're feeling and tell them, be honest. Um, if we want them to know it's okay to have a hard day, that it's okay to be sad, um, it's okay to be mad. We have to show them that we're feeling those things and that it's okay, right? And that's okay to talk about it. Um, you know, they have to see us go through those daily stressors and watch us coping with it. So modeling that behavior. Um, we're gonna go through coping strategies, you know, a little bit further on in this presentation. Um, but again, we can't just tell children what to do. We have to use those coping skills ourselves. Um, same with the self-care, right? Um, so we want to teach them preventative ways of coping with life and taking care of themselves. But they don't see us taking care of ourselves, right? Particularly during this pandemic with all these stressors. So I think it's our job as parents to take up this um, along with our children, do it with them as a team, right? Oh, 
All right. So with that evaluation, we look at our lifestyle and the way that we're taking care of ourselves. And that really comes down to um, sleep hygiene, we call it, which is really looking at, do I have a set schedule, right? Am I going to bed at the same time and getting up at the same time every day? Am I making sure I'm getting the rest I need so that I can actually balance my mental health, right? Without sleep, I can't manage my emotions. So modeling that to children, the importance of sleep, right? Instead of us uh, staying up all night, um, you know, racing around the house cleaning and, you know, binge watching TV, they see those things, right? Um, regular exercise, I know, is really hard for families right now. Um, so again, finding ways that work for your family and maybe doing them together, you know, uh, take a small walk around the block. I know it's really hot right now, so that's very difficult to do. I can't wait for the cooler weather so that, you know, we can get outside again and, you know, maybe ride bikes around the block, things like that. So trying to find ways that you can, anything you can do. Um, also just throwing out there with the exercise, I know there's so many of the streaming services that you can do on your TV together. Um, one of the fun things our family did this summer and during COVID was like just dance. Um, little ones can do it and like the whole family can do it together. It's silly. Um, and it's exercise, right? So that's something you can do, um, to get connected. Um, nutrition, right? I know this is something we're all working on. Um, children in particular, I think as parents, we all know how important it is for them to eat properly. Um, if they're not getting the right nutrients that their brain needs, they're not going to be able to regulate their emotions. But guess what? That's us too, right? So we worry about our children, but sometimes we forget to take care of ourselves in the process. Again, our children see that right? So if they see us skipping meals because we're too stressed or too busy, um, if they see us reaching for comfort foods to cope with our emotions, um, you know, all of those uh, ways of coping with life um, through poor eating habits, we want to try to challenge those and change them so that our kids can model that back for us. Um, so some additional coping strategies. So the lifestyle and the self-care ones are more of those preventative measures. Um, and then we have emotion regulation skills. So these are, I'm noticing that I'm having certain types of emotions and I'm going to pick a coping strategy that's going to help me manage those emotions. Um, so they can be somewhat preventative, excuse me. Um, but a lot of them are used to actually manage particular emotions. Um, so the first one is I feel statements. So in another slide, we talked about identifying and expressing your emotions. And I feel statements are the best way to do that. Um, so it's very simple. So it's just I feel blank, right? And before you can express that, you have to actually use mindfulness, right? Which we talk about kind of checking in with yourself. You can try on a few words, like I feel nervous. And you're like, no, that's not quite it. Like find that word that helps describe what you're feeling. You can um, get feelings charts. Um, there's tons of them on the internet and that can really help you identify what that emotion is. So you can practice this as a family. Um, I know some families do that around the dinner table, um, but just express yourself to anybody, right? And if our children see us expressing that, I feel, then they're going to maybe learn how to have that verbiage themselves to be able to first identify it and then be able to express it, right? We need to get it out. Um, another awesome way of getting it out is journaling. So we have this pent up uh, stress and emotions that we tend to store in our brains, in our bodies, and we need to get that energy out, right? So there's lots of different ways of doing that, but writing is awesome way of doing that. Um, and also our brain processes differently when we're writing than when we verbalize, um, what's going on with us. Um, 
I don't know about you guys, but uh, I've often been um, a little intimidated by journaling because I imagine someone who's writing this like really intelligent, like diary entry. And I'm just like, I'm not a writer. So I used to be intimidated, but, you know, through becoming a therapist, I recognize that journaling um, can be anything, you know, it doesn't have to be a dear diary. It can be just free writing. Um, it could be just jotting outlines just of what's going on with you. Um, it could be doodling. It could be anything. Um, and so it's really just about expression. So just expressing yourself. Um, Jordan actually taught me this next regulation skill and I absolutely love it so much. Um, so it's called break ice. Uh, we all know kids love um, anything that has to do with destroying things, right? That's so fun to them. Um, and oftentimes they're told they can't do it. So um, this coping strategy is holding ice in your hands. First thing we know is that change in temperature, it awakes our brain, right? And brings us to the present moment. So just the ice itself is a really effective coping strategy. Um, so that will already bring the child to the present moment instead of being inside their head. But breaking ice is literally you guys go outside and you break ice. You get to throw it on the ground and there's no way you're not going to giggle um, and get those frustrations out. So I think it's an amazing coping skill. Really great. I have a, uh, <laughs> thank you for that, by the way. Uh, quick thought on that, everybody. Yeah. Um, works incredibly well. But if you have the idea really quick that like, oh, we can maybe, you know, throw it in the bathtub or we can throw oh, it in yeah. the walk-in shower. I'm going to recommend you don't do that because <laughs> <laughs> the ice goes everywhere and if I can help <laughs> save a mess and possible damage to things you care about. Um, always yeah. try to go outside, use concrete for that one. <laughs> always outside, right? <laughs> I could totally see my kids breaking a... Um a bathroom mirror, right? Like they would just go to town or hitting each other in the eyes with it or something, right? So I think definitely oh, yes. spacing out. <laughs> I have seen some mistakes. So that's my little caveat for everybody on that. I appreciate that, Jordan. Absolutely. I, I didn't think to share that, but I could see my kids going to town with it. So yeah, outside, give every everybody enough space, right? Don't stand right next to each other because we all know kids will go to town, right? But that's good for them. And I think, you know, I noticed with my own kids too, that all day they're having to conform, right? Like, don't do that. Don't do that. Do this. Don't, you know, and so there's not a lot of space in their day where they get to just be kids, right? And just be wild. Um, so I love finding those things that they can do that are safe, but they can also kind of let loose. Um, so that breaking ice one, I think is really great. And it kind of reminds me of also like the trampoline parks, right? That's where I noticed that my kids get to just be kids, like just be wild, like go to town guys, um, as long as they're being appropriate, right? Um, so I think those coping strategies can be really helpful for kids um, and us, right? I mean, that's, we need it too. That sounds wonderful for us when we're having a stressful day, so um, music, I think is such a given, right? Um, such a great coping skill. If you ask children, that's their number one coping skill. That's the one they usually come up with. Um, it is, you guys know, as parents, it's the most important thing in their life outside of their cell phones. Right. Um, but you know, music is a really good coping skill. I think it also is important though. Um, I noticed to teach our children about how music can affect our brains and how it can affect our moods. And so like for me, I've recognized that there's certain music that affects my mood in a positive way, right? So um, there's music that immediately lift, lifts my mood and I'm in a good mood regardless of what's going on in my life. And we all know that there's those songs that although we can identify with them, they're going to make us sad, right? So I think that's a way that we can teach our children, but music is awesome for them. As I transition to our next slide here, I have to say that the I feel statements, when you said, you know, pick a word and try it on, that one's going to, 
haunt me and stay with me. I thought that was great. So no, that, that one doesn't feel quite right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, honestly, guys, we do it in groups all the time. Um, because, you know, I notice just with me, with uh, even the adults that I treat, you know, we, and you all know that we don't get taught these things in school, right? So we call it emotional intelligence and we focus a lot on learning math and, you know, reading and things like that, but we don't even really learn about feeling words, you know? So I think it's really cool just to show children like, Hey, I don't really, I'm not that great at identifying how I feel either, you know? Um, but let's change it together. Let's practice it. So a feeling shark can be really helpful. So that's a big one for me. Yeah. Uh, tools for parents, right? Like we need those tools. Um, if you're going to get your kids to use coping skills, we're going to have to work on connection, right? Um, our kids struggle to connect with us at times. They tend to think that we're not going to understand them. Um, we don't get it, right? And so we have to find ways to let them know that we might not always get it, but we're here for them, right? Um, during COVID, I think it's been difficult um, for us to engage in activities, and there's been so much stress that I think all of us are trying to figure out ways to reconnect with our children. Um, so here are some, you know, tips. Um, really, we talked about this during COVID, right, because there wasn't much that you could do um, during COVID. And so some of those things that we decided to do were like, get out of the house finally, right? Um, go to the park. Um, when's the last time you went to the park as a family? I know certain families go to the park all the time. And I think those families are just amazing. And I think there's other families that we get a little too caught up in our schedules, you know, when we forget to do those things together. Um, it is again, very hot right now. Um, but if you can, you know, get to the park as a family. Um, and really, I know in our family, we try to at least once a week do a family activity, right? Where we're all doing something together. Um, because during the week, although I might be driving my children to school or excuse me, we're having a meal, but it's a fast meal during the week, we struggle to connect together. Um, so we find something on the weekend. Um, everybody schedules different, but tried at least once a week to do that. Um, and again, we already kind of talked about this, but walking around the neighborhood. Um, so just, again, giving yourself a chance to have a, um, a light chat, right? Get that conversation just going, get your children used to just talking to you about their day, right? what happened today? What's going on? That way it's just normal for your kids to talk about their day. You don't try to have a conversation with them about their day when they're struggling, right? So again, this is one of those preventative things, build that connection before they're struggling. So that way, when they are struggling, they know what to do. It's just normal for them to chat and to connect with you. Normalize taking care of yourself, right? Um, so what we, part of that like role modeling for us is um, again, showing them that it is an important part of life to engage in self-care, right? So we have to model that for our children. Um, I think the next one is uh, really hard for parents. So, um, forgive me if it might seem a little provocative at first and we'll kind of chat it out. Um, so one thing as a therapist, I'd like to see parents do is normalize um, certain problematic behaviors. So what I mean by that is there are certain ways that children and adolescents tend to cope with stressors that are not healthy. Um, and Jordan mentioned some of those and some of them are self-harm. Um, it could be vaping, you know, there's all these different ways that they're dealing with these things and some of them terrify us. However, I think it's important for us to realize that some of those are um, kind of a norm, 
right, for children in their age group that are struggling with mental health issues. So in an essence, we kind of want to um, not act afraid. And when we're having these conversations with them, which is really hard because they're your babies, you know, so part of that is that validation process, like, wow, I, you know, it seems like you're really struggling with this. You know, I, I know that you're hurting yourself. Um, and so that shows me that you're struggling. Let's see what we can do to help, you know, instead of focusing so much on the actual behavior, um, which is just a negative coping mechanism. Um, Practicing mindfulness. Uh, this is a really big one. I know there's so many tools out there for parents these days. Um, you can buy, you know, mindfulness kits, mindfulness journals for children. Um, we have these mindfulness um, card decks for the younger kids um, at our house where they can do little mindfulness activities. Um, so you just pull a card and we practice the activity together. Um, they have some for sleep um, that you can do with them. Um, so I think just talking to our kids about mindfulness and what it is. So for anybody who might not know what mindfulness is, um, there's lots of different definitions for it and ways of thinking about it. But for me, the simplest way to, um, talk about mindfulness is just getting connected to your thought process, how you're feeling emotionally, your body. Um, and your surroundings, right? Um, so getting in the present moments, practicing being present um, and recognizing what's going on with you without judging it. Um, so if we can practice that with our children, that's going to give them um, a really big foundation that they're going to be able to use um, to practice those coping skills. Yeah, uh, screen time, right? The parents like a uh, nemesis, right? <laughs> um, our kids love screens, uh, you know, and I know before I was a parent, I had these ideas of, you know, my children loving books and, you know, that we weren't going to watch a lot of TV and, you know, we weren't going to be those parents who let the screens babysit our children. And then I had children and, they just automatically gravitated towards screens and electronics. And I think over time, I've had to kind of um, come to an acceptance that that's their reality. You know, they've grown up with this being their norm, right, compared to us. And so finding ways to utilize um, technology so that um, children can adapt and use coping skills with electronics, right? So there's tons of really, really great apps um, that your children can use and you can help them practice these mindfulness skills or even um, emotion regulation skills using these um, tools. And it gets them excited about it and gets them to actually do it. Um, so one of these um, Jordan has on here is Colorfly. So these are apps where you can do mindfulness coloring, but on the tablet right, or on a phone. Um, and the point of coloring, and, you know, there's a lot of adult coloring books out there, and I've tried this coping skill recently myself. The point of it is to get you out of your head, right? So anxiety comes from um, a fear of the future, right? But we're not in the future, we're in the now, right? And the future hasn't happened yet. So if we can practice something that's difficult, our brain can't think about the future. So it's a really positive way of keeping us in the present moment. Um, Jordan, I totally forget about Rooted again. Can you <laughs> no, I'll, I'll give this good. one? Well, and, and right. really, really quick, just an additional thought on that. Um, yeah. So like Colorfly, it's, it's really good because it helps take you out of your head. But um, a thought that I just had as you were discussing it is I was, I get, um, people give me a hard time sometimes because I'm like, I don't mind doing a lot of cleaning around the house. Mm. Like I really enjoy doing the dishes in a weird way. Like never tell my wife that I said that. But, <laughs> yeah. Uh, that being said, it's, you know, if 
I, first off, I get stressed out looking at messes and things like that. But especially yeah. if I've had a long day, if I've had, you know, I've, I'm trying to go through different things, there's stuff going on in personal life or anything like that. Sometimes just spending that time, even if it's, you know, 10 minutes or it's 20 minutes, how, it depends on how much you let your dishes stack up. Sometimes mm-hmm. really just sitting there and being there in that activity, that can be so much. And so that's that's exactly what I think of with the coloring as well is it's the mm-hmm. non-chore version of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 There's a lot of mindfulness activities that are geared towards sensations, right? So actually doing the dishes um, is a really great example of that. So when you're doing your dishes mindfully, what you're doing is you're not just doing your dishes and thinking about all your stressors, right? What you're doing is like actually getting in the moment, feeling the water, right? The temperature of the water, the suds of the soap, and just really focusing and that can really get you grounded. So there's a lot of good mindfulness activities with dishes. Yeah. Well, and then, um, so rooted it's, it, yeah, Yeah. it's been a while since I I haven't talked about too much, but this is an app that you can have that's there. I don't know if there's, I I doubt there's a, a subscription free, maybe there's a premium version. I don't know, but it really helps with anxiety and, they have some different things you can do that can help walk you through going through a panic attack even. So mm. especially if you're, if you've ever experienced those before, or if, you know, very prone to anxiety, it has some different tools and functions in there that really help um, kind of get you back in a, in a good space, good head space. Cool. I'm going to have to go on and I keep forgetting to try that one. So um, calm is one that I absolutely use. Um, calm does have a free version and then they do have a subscription. I, I have the subscription, um, calm is a meditation app, but it has more than that. It has, um, all types of guided meditations that you can think of. Um, it also has the daily calm, which I really like. So it's about a 10 minute meditation, but always has a theme. So the idea is that you do it every day and then you kind of carry that theme with you and it helps you practice mindfulness and integrate it into your life. Um, But there's also um, lots of stuff for children on Calm. So there's children-based meditations that you can practice with them. And there's a lot of stories on there. So if you have children who struggle to go to sleep and sleep is um, very difficult with children these days, particularly with anxiety, Um, so if your child's struggling to sleep, you can put on, um, a bedtime story. They have a lot of really good children's bedtime stories. Um, so it might be something to try. That's a game changer right there. It really is. My, I mean, my son is autistic and, uh, he loves the solar system and he, um, loves this one about the universe and the solar system. And it's, um, performed by, um, LeVar Barton, I think the guy from Reading Rainbow. Rainbow. Yeah. 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 And he loves it and it's really long. And so he always ends up falling asleep. He doesn't get through it. So it's really helpful. Well, wonderful. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to try and jump back in over here. We're going to go through um, just a few more things for you guys. Hey, Jordan, um, real quick. Can I just yes, go sir. bust in and Um, Some people from the chat were sharing. I know you guys are trying to stay on track, um, but I'm just kind of going through some of the stuff that that some of the people in the chat are doing. Um, So uh, Junical Holmes, she said she or he, not sure which, because I don't know what that name is. I apologize. Uh, Puzzles do it for me. Uh, Mm -hmm. Jennifer Peterson um, says Shine, Mindfulness Coach, and Insight Timer are also good mindfulness apps. And um, Kayla Klug, uh, my daughter and I love the bedtime story stories and music from calm. Um, yeah. Donna Blair says, I would feel like a complete failure as a parent if my suicidal teen. Oh, that's a different one. Sorry. Um, ran into that. Uh, okay. That's it for now. I'll yeah. Thank you guys for sharing you guys. what you've used, right? Cause that's how we find these tools is by talking to each other. Right. So again, like Jordan was saying, we tend to not talk about our struggles, but we also tend to not talk about the things that we're using to help with our mental health. Again, that stigma prevents us from, I think, sometimes admitting that we need these things or that we're doing them. We're sometimes embarrassed, but we shouldn't be, right? This is um, wonderful anytime we're willing to work on ourselves. So I love that we share our secrets, right? Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Thank you, guys. 
Well, and, and so just to give you guys a few more tools that are here. So one thing that we've been sharing as well is um, giving some coping skills that are directed at teens as well, that they can practice on their own. Um, you know, there is, we, we kind of in, in trying to figure out how can we make things as effective, especially for teenagers as possible, is that, you know, the idea of having like a little coping skills list or a little booklet or something like that, that, you know, you can put in your wallet or your purse or something like that. Um, it's helpful, but in all reality, there's still some stigma that's there, right? We might not want our friends to know about these things or that sort of thing. Um, so we actually did put together a little web page as well that has some different coping skills that are more effective for youth. Um, they're effective for everybody, but um, we are sharing that as well. So if you guys would like to share that with those in your life, um, if you have a cell phone, I don't know if you're watching this on your cell phone, but feel free. You can either take a screenshot of this and revisit it later, but if you're on 10 or 11 or so. so. Uh, don't worry. I know you're wondering. Rate ice is on there. Yeah. I did put it on there. Make sure you, you know, trust the <laughs> Go out there. Uh, but I want to share that with you guys. I'm going to leave it up for just two minutes. So if you haven't taken a screenshot, make sure you do so now or scan that QR code. Um, and if you still, you go, Jordan, I watched this on my phone. I didn't get to take that. Just reach out to us after the presentation. Um, you can email us. We'd be happy to share that page with you as well. In case you want to share with anyone, or better yet, even if you, you know, you take part in community things and share that with members of your community, we'd be happy to do so. Uh, but at this point, I do really want to give a bit of an overview of just kind of a lot of people don't, if you've never had an experience with a psychiatric hospital before, there's a lot of scary images that come to mind. And so I'd like to take an opportunity to share a little bit about what things look like for us as a hospital, for what we do on an inside side of things, you know, what a typical experience looks like. But um, first and foremost, once Aurora, uh, we are the largest psychiatric healthcare hospital system in the state of Arizona. So we do have two hospitals. There's one that's virtually behind me. Uh, and that one, I'm actually in Glendale. Um, however, we have two hospitals, one in Tempe and one is in Glendale. Um, so we have 238 inpatient psychiatric beds and we work with uh, youth starting at age 13 all, and then adults as well. Um, and so with that, we do provide inpatient services. It's probably what we're most known for is being an inpatient hospital. Uh, but we work with folks very simply on uh, things like depression, anxiety and substance use treatment. Um, we're there to really support our community in any way that we can there. Um, and so within that, our two hospitals, they're kind of located centrally in both sides of the valley. So Tempe, we're actually on Guadalupe and Maple. So right next to Kyrene Road, we're actually right next to Kiwanis Park. You could drive by it and never realize. Uh, in Glendale, we're on 59th Avenue and Peoria, just tucked away across from a Home Depot. Same thing, you could drive by every day and not know that it's a psychiatric hospital. So um, within that, we do have an outpatient center built into both of our buildings. Um, and within that, we're able to provide that big continuum of care. I know we showed that little model earlier saying what the different things are. Um, so currently, we also do offer that partial hospitalization service, which again, could be um, for somebody who maybe doesn't quite hit criteria for inpatient care, they're not there. There's a lot of concerning things, but they're just not at that point. Um, or it could be a great step down for someone coming out of an inpatient setting. Um, and then just outpatient services. We generally refer to that as a lot of our intensive outpatient groups. We have all kinds of different groups. And because we're very youth focused in this presentation, we'll participate in group therapy uh, for three days a week for up to six to eight weeks. Um, and again, it's such an effective thing that, it's a little more intensive than individual therapy, but it really can go a long way to help preventing some of those crises and the hospitalizations that can occur. So within that, I'll also show you. So this is a picture of the hospital that I am sitting in right at this moment. Um, so that is a, a picture of a back courtyard that we have at our hospital. And so one thing that's really big about us is, and it's important to our hospitals, is that we have a holistic approach. And that's really looking at not just the psychiatric side to things. It's not looking at just medications. We want to look at things that contribute to our mental health, such as what are some of the medical things that might be playing a part in that? Um, obviously psychiatric, um, what are psychological things that are happening? So the big difference between those two guys is psychiatric really has to do with our brain chemistry. And turns out our, our brains are full of chemicals. And when those chemicals get off, it affects us in a lot of different ways. That's why medication can be a really um, effective tool. Um, however, the psychological side of things is actually more to do with our actual thoughts on things. How do we think in situations? How do we perceive? How do we problem solve? How do we do these things? Am I blocked in any way in those sorts of things? So it's looking at those aspects um, as well. Um, in addition to that spiritual, we have a chaplain at both of our hospitals that provide spirituality groups and really can help with things like grief and loss and just spirituality in general. It's not focused on one religion um, and it's an optional group for folks to go to because we really want to help folks heal because a lot of times we do have uh, individuals here that maybe have just, they've lost someone, they've been struggling. Sometimes it's been pretty recent. Sometimes it's, it's been months ago and things have been on a downward spiral since then. 
Um, we also look very heavily at nutrition. Um, I know there's a stigma against hospital food. It's out there. I get it. I've had some bad hospital food in my time, but not here. Um, so even down to our leadership uh, at our hospital here, our CEO, he's kind of a farmer. Nutrition has maybe been off balance and things like that. We want to help make sure that we're healing people holistically within just with the food that people are eating. So the food that we get for our hospital, um, we try and go as many, as many times as we can, locally sourced things like fruits and vegetables, um, organic whenever it's possible. We do grass-fed beef. Um, and really, our, our kitchens, they put together these meals every day um, and usually have a few different options available that are, it's scratch cooked every day, fresh. So I know there's the idea out there that it's okay, here's some heat and meat and that sort of thing, but it's something that we pride ourselves in. We really think that that's a great way to start the healing process for folks. Um, and then I'll share with you all. So previously I worked primarily with teenagers and um, I usually worked with teenagers who come in just out of the hospital. And I would always ask a really foolish question. I would say, well, how was the hospital? And they would say, hmm, boring. And I go, oh, okay. I said, well, what did you do? And they go, well, I went to groups. And I'd say, okay, what, you know, what did groups look like? Realistically, I could have asked some better questions. But I had this idea in my head of what a hospital looked like because I had only visited maybe for meetings and things like that. I really hadn't seen a whole lot. And groups was a much different answer uh, once I actually worked at a psychiatric hospital. And myself, my entire team, we talk about things that we do at the hospital all the time. So we actually shadow the entire hospital, all of the departments for over a month. And I learned that groups were actually way more fun than what they sounded when I asked uh, a few teenagers about it. Um, so one of the things is we do adjunctive and recreation-based therapy. So if you have this picture in your head that someone goes to a group and it's, you know, there's 10 people and they all sit around in a circle, don't get me wrong, some groups function that way in there. Um, we even do dialectical behavioral therapy in there sometimes as well, um, two different modalities. But the rest of the groups that we do are recreation-based. These are the different types of groups that people generally will go through. Is uh, We can do music therapy. We can do aroma therapy. We actually have some like doTERRA and stuff like that that we can pull out. Um, as you guys just saw, our Glendale Hospital does have a pool. So during some months that accommodate for it, we can even do aquatics groups. We can do yoga in the water if we'd like. Uh, if we don't want to go in the water, we can do yoga on land, uh, meditation, dance and movement therapy, art, poetry. It's instant. It's interesting because these all just sound like activities, but realistically, um, these are actually therapeutic modalities. So individuals go to school specifically to become a dance and movement therapist. They really they, they require the same certifications as someone who goes to school to be um, whether it's a substance use therapist or general mental health therapist. Um, and then lastly, we, we do pet and equine therapy at, at our hospitals uh, every week. And so people always kind of question that one. They're like, hold on, equine horses, where do you put the horses? Well, you guys just saw a picture back there of one area outside that we can have our horses. But truth be told, a lot of the months it's too hot. We bring two to three gigantic horses into our gym once a week at both locations. Uh, and it's fantastic. It's easily one of my favorite things that I like to you know, go down there. If I'm in the hospitals, I like to pop down there and go say hi to our great therapists. And of course, say hello to the horses. Um, but the last question here is that again, what does it actually look like on the unit? What does a multidisciplinary team actually look like? It's made up of so many different people and it can, it's an internal medicine physician. It's a really come up with a plan that's going to work well with it. Um, we've actually even just very recently, we had a request for a completely kosher, um, meal as well, or, you know, kosher diet plan, as well as all of the cooking instruments to be used in that way. We accommodated it within an hour. Um, in addition to that, we have our behavioral health technicians on the unit. I don't know if you guys can hear it, but we have some sirens going by. It happens every once in a while. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we have chat as well. Uh, so one last thing, and this is something we're very proud of, uh, is that we have actually been community voted the number one behavioral hospital in the state of Arizona. Um, our two hospitals function as a system. We've won that for the past four consecutive years, and it's something we're very proud of, but we can't keep winning that without your support. And so we're so thankful to our community for those that have supported us and continue to support us um, in our effort just to be there for our community. Um, hey, Jordan, we do have some yeah. questions. Let's go for it. Awesome. Uh, let me get to the right one. Um, so just so everybody knows, we will be emailing out a recording for over the in the next couple of days, yes. um, a link to the recording. Um, Jordan, will that have the PowerPoint in it or? It, um, okay. it, so it'll be a recording of the PowerPoint. Um, okay. And then we can provide some of the PowerPoint as well, too, just in like a handout for folks. Okay. 
that would be fantastic. Um, the next question was, do you have any thoughts or experience with added sugar as a source or cause of mental health issues? Ooh. And that question um, is best because we did obviously talk about the nutrition in the hospitals. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's, the truth is, I mean, you go on Google, there's, there's all kinds of thoughts on all kinds of different things like that. Um, in my experience, there's a relationship with sugar, there's a relationship with caffeine and how things like that affect. Um, I don't know that there's been a lot of, you know, longitudinal studies and things like that that can directly link certain things. So like sugar intake to depression or that sort of thing. Um, but again, what we're talking about are chemicals. And so, you know, sugar is really delicious. Um, that's why food can easily become a coping skill. And it's something for us to be very mindful of. Um, it can bring us instant joy. And what happens is when we feel those things, when we, when we have that, uh, feeling same thing as we do with alcohol, which is obviously a different chemical, um, chemicals in your brain release at different points in time. And so there's a lot of things that can impact that. Um, so, as Jacqueline mentioned earlier, diet is just a huge part of things. As much as we can, uh, healthy foods are recommended as healthy foods because they're healthy foods. <laughs> and so as much as we can, let's try and make sure that we're balancing those things out. Um, but it's been fascinating because even working with adolescents who, again, have very severe symptoms of ADHD, um, I've had parents I worked with that said, oh, I, you know, I read on the internet, you know, um, give my child caffeine and they'll actually mellow out. And there have been some studies that show that the caffeine can be a really helpful thing for brain activity. Um, however, when, when the person, you know, gave the, the caffeine, it also is accompanied by a lot of sugar. And so those two things balanced out in a way that did not go so well, or at least it didn't go according to that plan because um, sugar, there's a sugar high, there's, you know, a lot of ways that sugar can impact us. Um, and so, you know, the idea here was that this will help somebody, you know, kind of not feel like they have to bounce off the walls. And unfortunately, if the caffeine had helped, the sugar certainly didn't. So uh, I would just say as much as you can try and have a balanced diet. And it's certainly on that. Uh, the answer is yes. So equine specifically is offered for some outpatient groups at our hospitals, um, depending on group times and availability. Um, so for example, right now we have two of our different outpatient groups in Tempe that experience equine on a weekly basis. And it just has to do with how the schedule um, is aligned right now. And then over at Glendale, where we have Jacqueline here, um, we have equine every Friday morning, I believe. Um, and so with that, we try and help uh, as many people as we can that are coming to it experience these groups. Um, and we're constantly talking about ways that we can offer it to more and more folks in an outpatient setting. Awesome. Um, I think that looks like all the questions that I can see in here. Um, so, yeah. Wonderful. Well, guess. let me share a few more things. And then again, if questions continue to come to you folks, please continue to ask them. We're going to leave things up here for a little bit, um, just in case we know that some questions will come probably at the end as well. Uh, but I, I mentioned earlier, there's some things you can do that you can be proactive about that you can uh, have as resources in your phone that you can, you know, be able to do. Here's one of the easiest ones you can do. You can take a screenshot of this right here. This is our assessment line that we have. It's 24 um, seven. All calls that come into our hospital actually go to our admissions call center that we have at our Tempe hospital. So when you call one of our facilities, you call both. But what I want to encourage everyone to think about with this is that if you have that family member that, or you have that person in your life that you're getting concerned about, um, and maybe it's been that something promise, you know, I'm okay. I, I promise I was just kidding. In reality, guys, don't take that chance. Um, if you can, there's a lot of resources out there. There's crisis lines. There's the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. We have a 24-7 line for admissions. We can always do free assessments for folks. Um, we certainly encourage you. One of the next ones on the interview, this is actually one of our uh, big partners through, we have a parent company called Signature Healthcare, and actually all of the Signature Hospitals we support a local foundation called the Jason Foundation. Um, they provide so many different youth resources for mental health and suicide prevention. And we highly encourage you guys to check out their websites, the jasonfoundation.com, um, sorry, .org. Uh, and within that, they have a line that you can talk as well. You can call this number and you can get immediately set up with a crisis counselor. Um, in addition to that, um, if you, another one, I'm sorry, we didn't write it down. If you have somebody text home, to 741741. That is also a crisis text line that both adults and youth can use. Um, 
So within that, folks, we really encourage you guys, uh, please continue to ask questions. If this was a helpful presentation for you guys to come to today, we really hope uh, that you'll join us for more in the future. Um, actually, next week we're hosting, it's going to be a little different, uh, but we're going to be doing a virtual webinar that we are doing in partnership with the Scottsdale Youth and Community Coalition, as well as the Arizona National Guard Counter Drug Task Force. Um, this is something we did this as a uh, continuing education opportunity for the um, for folks that you know are on our distribution and email list, and it's called Kids at Risk Snapchat: The Newest Drug Dealing Trend, and it had just vital information that every parent should know um, about what kids can do and what things are being tracked on phones, um, especially when it comes to Snapchat conversation with some very vital information. Uh, now let's hear. We were your presenters this evening, myself and Jacqueline Ojala. Um, that is our contact information. If you have questions, if you want to do some follow-up stuff, if if some of the things uh, sounded like something you, you needed to look into for yourself or a family member, um, and or just had more questions about the different kinds of programs or care or anything like that, we'd be happy to help you out and answer some of those questions. So those are our phone numbers and emails there for, where you can reach us here at the hospital. Uh, but other than that, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing the screen here, and uh, we're going to let things uh, back open. I'm going to pull our chat here and see how things are going. Um, and um, Jordan, can I add something yeah. to about intakes? Please. Um, I think one of the things we see in outpatient, too, that I think um, a lot of people don't know is we also do intakes in outpatient. Um, so, you know, if you... Uh, you know, see some of those warning signs and you know that your child doesn't necessarily need inpatient at this time, but you're interested in getting them um, set up for some help, you can call us directly um, to the outpatient department. And we would love to answer any questions you might have about treatment, about intake, um, uh, if you need resources, um, our case manager is really helpful in finding you guys those things. And so the number that Jordan shared is our direct number to outpatient, and we'd love to be of service um, in any way that we can. So don't hesitate to call us directly as well. Wonderful. Absolutely. Particularly all those busy parents taking this time for your children is just such a blessing to your families. So just that desire to, um, does a lot for children very much um all right i do see we have so we have a couple of hands raised um not sure what to do on those ones i'll just be honest with you <laughs> uh, again if you have an ability to oh good question the kid at risk webinar mm -hmm. is that for free as well it absolutely is yeah we we provide as many community education opportunities as possible to the, to the public and uh, our goal is to never one charge for them so we've been very successful in doing that for years i myself have been here over three and a half years and I have no intention of trying to put a price tag on, on information like this. So, yeah, we would love to have you there. Wow. Thank you for all the comments, everybody. Uh, these are wonderful. We're glad this is helpful. Oh, thank you. Um, let's see here. Still with the, I, okay, with the hand, okay. Let's see here. Ooh, okay, this is a good question. Um, I'd, like, I'd like to ask about video games. Mm. It seems like a battle limiting it. My son yeah. pushes for more time, but I feel like it encourages isolation from the family. He mostly plays games on his phone. Oof, that's that's kind of a double there. Jacqueline, yeah. do you have some thoughts on that one? Yeah, I do. Um, I I just, first of all, I have to validate the struggle, right? I, and normalize it. I think that all parents are struggling with this right now. I think we all see the value in our children having a break. Um, I know for me with my kids, they're so busy, right? Um, school's hard. Every, there's just so many demands on them that I know it's their release, right? So it's their time where they get to check out. Now checking out all the time is not healthy, right? And so I know that that's where parents have a struggle. Um, so partly what I wanna say is that I think it is important for us to recognize how important video games are to our children and what they do for them. And so if we don't recognize that, our children aren't going to value our opinion when we ask them to stop, right? So we have to show them that we get it, how important it is to them. Um, so I think making sure that you're doing it, you're also healthy, 
Um, and everything tells me that it's not healthy for your brain to have a ton of screen time. So I just tell him why, you know, and oftentimes we feel like we shouldn't have to explain to our children why, but we do. And there's that. <laughs> That's a big part of it. Also consider it. I'm not saying make it okay because it's okay for other people, but right. um, realize the it's a different time as well. Um, I mean, right. I know that myself, I'm, I'm now thankfully more than 10 years out of high school and things like that. Right. But there's still, as I, you know, I grew up, grew up with stuff like that. I, I understand a little bit from where it comes from, but you have to also think about, okay, what is, what are things that maybe their friends are experiencing and stuff like that too. And so trying to find that balance, that's going to be what's going to work best for you and your family and your child. Um, but knowing that a, a child just wants to do nothing but stick, stick their head in their phone or play video game, knowing that there's, there's something normal societally about that is, is also a very real thing too. So yeah. it's, it's, it's not an easy thing and there's not a perfect answer for it. <laughs> no, there isn't. Right. And like, you'll read those articles that say, you know, this, um, age of child should only have this amount of screen time. And I think we take that with a grain of salt as parents, right? So be careful being very strict, you know, according to those guidelines, because every child's different and every family is different, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think for me, what I do, if I'm going to set limits um, on video games, um, I usually use incentives. So, you know, if um, you can get this, this, and this done, I would love to be able to give you your free time. We call it free time in my house instead of video games. Now he's going to choose video games for his free time, right? But, um, you know, I think if there's nothing else the child's supposed to be doing, they get to choose their free time, right? And sometimes I'll say, okay, I, I'm going to give you uh, 30 minutes on the video game, and then you have to come watch a family movie together, right? That's how you can earn your video game time is by spending time with the family. So kind of, you know, negotiate and bargain in those types of ways. So making sure that the child has to connect in order to also have their um, personal time. That helps us. I don't know if that'll help your family, but yeah, tends to work. I think that's it's a, it's a great one. And, and uh, looks like Carly had said that uh, a 12 year old daughter addicted to some screen time and what's a recommended amount of, you know, time per week. And, and it's kind of tough because again, mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be a little bit based on maybe age. It's going to be based on, you know, quite a few different factors. Um, one thing that has been effective that we've done before or that I've, you know, done in previous experiences is um, especially if it's a really big issue is sometimes titrating it down to, okay, we're going to do, you're going to earn it based on other, you know, better activities to do. So for example, yeah. if you can commit 30 minutes to reading, you're going to get 30 minutes equal of that to video game mm -hmm. time and stuff like that. And so when you do things like that, if you can build it into that, or if you, you know, want to assign different, you know, maybe school related activities or mm -hmm. a physical activity outside or something different like that, that can be, you know, a little bit better for your mental health. Um, at a certain point, you're going to run out of time in the day. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, even if they've earned two hours, two and a half hours of screen time, th there's also been a two to two and a half hours of other productive time. As well. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's what we do. Like um, incentivize it with pro-social activities, right? So if they have siblings, um, if you go to the time also, um, you know, sometimes he's watching um, something about space on YouTube and then sometimes um, he's watching really, um, silly videos that, um, you know, maybe aren't so healthy. So sometimes I'll say, okay, I'll allow you iPad time, but only if you're willing to watch these types of videos. And usually they want it bad enough that they'll say, okay. Fine. <laughs> so that's kind of what we do too. Trick them. <laughs> yeah, we trick them. Right. Yeah. So like, okay, yes, I'm going to give you screen time, but I'm going to try to make it some healthier. So like removing, like, like you've watched that same video a hundred times and I don't think it's healthy for you. So yes, you can have iPad, but you watch that video. You have to try something else, um, that kind of stuff. So I don't know if that helps. Oh, I, I, I think that's great advice personally. Um, and uh, sorry, it's either Chayla or Kayla. I'm not sure what your preference is, but it was really said it is hard to remove screen time without replacing it with something else. You know, your kids got involved in other things, bikes, gymnast gymnastics, crafts, um, and now they rarely play their online games. Mm -hmm. um, so a big one with that and a thought that came to mind is uh, strength-based choices go a long way. Um, and so be prepared yourself with some of what those activities can be. Um, mm -hmm. And so what, what that comes down to is, well, what can I do then? Yes. Instead of keeping it really open-ended and saying, well, you can do these 10 things. I would say pick maybe two to three and mm -hmm. say, well, you can do this or you can do this. 
that typically and honestly it works better the younger the child is um how i mean teenagers they they get pretty smart pretty quick on that one uh however Mm -hmm. you uh i I would recommend having that and if you can write down some other activities and just keep those in your um oh my gosh your utility belt like your batman you know pull those out as you need to and switch it up don't give the same two activities every day tomorrow Mm -hmm. pick two different ones and that'll help keep things a little fresh You made me think of a tool um, that really works, particularly with younger children, adolescents, and you have to do it. So set those limits with them, but that helps younger kids. I like that a lot. And I apologize, Shayla. I'm so sorry. I feel so foolish. Um, I'm so sorry. I got your name wrong. The second I saw you put it there, I was like, nope, yep, that's you say that. (laughs) (laughs) So I I apologize. Uh, And we also had, um, I just want to validate Irma. You said, you know, my daughter says we don't understand her when she's frustrated. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know the quick thought I have, and I'm, I'm as much as I used to think I'm, you know, still closer to the generation growing up right now, um, the generation that reason me, there's still part of me that goes like, you know, I grew up with technology, I grew up with the internet, I grew up with, you know, most of our advances that we have at this point in time, but I still think that even a separation of X number of years, I, I don't know what kids right now are going through. Um, mm-hmm. Throw a pandemic on top of that, frustration, I mean, even if it's, that's what she's identifying it as, is don't understand when I'm frustrated. Who's to say it's even just frustrated? And so I think yeah. it's just an open conversation opportunity at that point, really saying, you know, I want to learn more and, and really help me out. I, I want to know what you're, I want to know what it feels like. Um, and maybe you don't know what that, you know, how to express that. <laughs> Let's try something different with that too. So yeah. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that too, Jacqueline. Yeah, I do actually. Um, I think you're right, Jordan, and you guys are on the right track that when kids say you don't understand, you don't get it, I think it's okay and important to actually say, you know what, you're right, I probably don't Yeah. say that, you know, but say, but I want to, and even if I don't understand it, I want to be there for you as you try to figure it out, right? So I think just saying those things helps them kind of come down a notch to be able to just kind of start verbalizing, right? And say, I just want to be here for you, you know, so try to tell me. Um, and if you can't tell me, I'll just sit here with you, you know, or we maybe we can watch a movie together. Um, maybe I don't have to know, you know, but maybe I could just be here for you. Um, so those are some things that you can try. That alone, just even just mm-hmm. sitting there in silence sometimes, that mm-hmm. being there for somebody, yeah, that just ask, so like, more effective. are you okay with me um, being with you? Like, say, can I just sit with you then? Can I just hug you or can I hold your hand? Um, is that okay with you? If you don't want to talk about it or, you know, I don't, if you feel like I won't understand that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Oh, thank you so much for sharing, everybody. You guys, these are yeah. great questions or great comments. Um, and I think a running thing between all of this and what's even just occurred to me as reading through these is that you guys aren't alone. Mm-hmm. A lot of these questions have very similar yeah. uh, themes to them. A lot of the same central message that's within it's that we're all in this together. We're all continuously always learning. Um, and I encourage everybody to continue <laughs> to, to be this mm-hmm. proactive and continue to try and learn. Yeah. And I think um, the last thing I want to say here, Jordan is um, with Cheryl's comment and um, I think, you know, for me, I have to kind of watch my expectations on my kiddos sometimes too. You know, we want so much for them and we want to um, help them be as successful as possible. And so sometimes we are a little too controlling, I think, you know, and sometimes I try to pull it back and go like, man, I'm asking a lot of a kid in the middle of a global pandemic, you know, like, And he is doing pretty well. And so maybe, maybe this Saturday, it's been an extremely rough week for all of us. And I'm just going to let him do whatever he wants all day on Saturday. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes we do that as a family, you know, whereas before I probably wouldn't have done that. But I feel like sometimes my kiddo just needs that release. He needs to just check out for a Saturday, stay in his undies, watch television, do iPad, you know, do whatever he wants to do. And so we do try to let co control sometimes, which is hard. It is hard. And you feel guilty sometimes, but I don't think we need to, because sometimes that's what our kids need. Absolutely. Yeah, actually. And you just reminded me of everything. And so when we can role model that and say like, well, I'm a lot older than that. And I'm still figuring things out. I'm learning mm-hmm. something new each day. Uh, it can help reassure kids a bit on that because yeah. 
really what they want is to be treated like an adult, like someone who is going to be taking care of themselves one day. Whether they can care of themselves and they're very autonomous right now, or they, they can't really do anything without an additional support and guidance. <laughs> so I think keeping that in mind, that that's a general theme that a lot of our kids uh, out there really just want to feel. Well, let's see here, folks, if we have any other, um, again, thank you so much, all of the just great questions, great comments. Um, and I got questions. So for some, I uh, would like a lot of our events that we do, we do, you know, certificates of attendance. Um, we do a lot of virtual CEU events as well. So um, especially for folks that are in therapy roles and things like that, we really geared this towards parents and teachers and therapists, uh, even if they'd like to attend as well. Uh, so this one is more of just a general event. So we aren't providing a uh, continuing education credit for it. But we can do a certificate of ascent of attendance. Um, so if you would like to have a certificate of attendance, um, whether you you know attended this maybe through work or something like that, we're happy to do that for you. Just go ahead and shoot us an email and we're happy to send something over to you. Uh, but yeah, I will not be CEU.